us. So welcome everyone to today's discussion panel on uh, uh, trustworthy artificial intelligence. And we will uh, focus on general questions and mostly on generative AI. Let me introduce myself. My name is Alžbieta Solarčík Krausová. I am a lawyer, so I am sorry for the panelists because it's a lawyer going to inquire them. Uh, I work at the Czech Academy of Sciences and I have the pleasure and honor to welcome here six wonderful men, each of them representing uh, one, uh, of the, one of the networks of excellence. Uh, so, here is uh, Josef Siewicz uh, from uh, Cirk and from Elise, uh, Janis Kom... and I train it. <laughs> Kompatiaris, thank you so much, uh, from AI for Media. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Sven Meyer from uh, Humane AI Net, uh, Holger Hoss from Vision, Roman Bartak uh, from... Um, uh, Taylor, thank you so much. And uh, we have uh, Mario Fritz from Elsa. So, men, thank you so much you. for uh, joining me here and from, for coming to this discussion panel. And as we are going to speak about trustworthy artificial intelligence, uh, my first question to you, and I, it will not be like at school, I will just uh, give, give you the opportunity to uh, take the microphone and start speaking yourself. What do you see as uh, trustworthy AI? What do you think that are the main characteristics of uh, trustworthiness in AI systems and potentially also in large language models and generative AI? So who is going to be the person to take the first floor? Okay, so go ahead, please. <laughs> okay, I actually on yeah. don't know. Uh, I think we already have heard some uh, technical definitions and I think the EU also laid out some of the main direction in terms of transparency privacy robustness and so on but I think we all should stress that kind of the compliance with the side of values is the one side in terms of technology but I think maybe even more po important or the, the governance aspect how to bring them in reality and also include people to actually um, earn their trust and also keep their trust okay thank you Please. So maybe we can do it in a round. <laughs> so when we discuss in Taylor, what does it mean? I mean, we discuss the problem of measuring trustfulness of the system. And it's not easy, right? Because uh, what does it mean to trust somebody? So I said, okay, let's forget about AI and let's speak about people. So it, how do you measure trustfulness of a person, right? What helps you to trust somebody? Is it like education of a medical doctor? Is it certification? Is it experience? Is it like past performance of this? And all these things are included. So I somehow believe that we can learn from people how they trust and we can then just translate this to systems and directly apply these uh, observations or, or beliefs about others to AI systems. Interesting. Thank you so much. So, so, so I'm not okay. sure that we want to do full round. So I'm going to pass on this one because these two gentlemen have said pretty much anything I would have wanted to say. And I'd rather go through more questions. Okay. And by the way, from the audience, you can just scan the QR code and ask questions through Slido. Whenever you will ask a question, you, we will see it here. Uh, the the screen will turn blue and we will try to reply to your questions. Just uh, so wanted to give an example, uh, not a definition, but just an example maybe to make, the, to make it more clear because it was discussed uh, during uh, the demos. So I think an important aspect of um, uh, trust is uh, explainability to understand uh, why uh, AI, why the algorithms is uh, suggesting uh, something. And uh, one of the ways we try to address it in uh, AI for uh, uh, media is uh, to have uh, an interaction with the uh, AI uh, system uh, to try to see the immediate uh, uh, results and from these results to understand uh, the overall suggestion and uh, so on. So uh, let's say just a specific uh, uh, example uh, can be explainability through interaction. 
Interesting. Thank you so much. Josef, do you have any more comments on trustworthiness from your perspective? I think I'll pass on this one as well. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's focus on other or questions. I mentioned in the beginning that the hype currently is generative AI. And we you can see it everywhere on the media. And my question to the gentleman here is how do you see generative AI? And from your perspective, from your from the perspective of your network of excellence, what is the state of the art? Do you use it? How do you use it? Uh, can you see some risks or what are the opportunities for you? So maybe I will start with Josef. <laughs> So maybe uh, this, so from the perspective of the network, of course. So in LEZ, uh, there are uh, programs which are very, I mean, which have uh, generative AI in their heart. So there is an LP program which is very much related to the language models. Uh, there is a computer vision uh, program related to the visual uh, mm -hmm. generation. There is a human-centric program which is studying the questions of of trustworthiness, for example. Uh, so I think there is a lot of people working in this area. I think in, in overall uh, state of the art, I think we, we it's evolving very quickly. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think the systems are you know getting improved. Uh, I mean, as we speak, uh, and I, I would say maybe one thing which I think it's important is the openness, because I think in that it, for these systems, these generative systems, when the and it's not only the system itself, but also the data that has been trained on. Once it becomes open, it can be really inspected, studied by the whole scientific community built upon, but also uh, understood better and in all the weaknesses and potential opportunities can be exposed better once they can be studied by the scientific community. So I would sort of vouch here for the openness in this area, uh, which I think could be uh, you know, one of the things we in Europe try to push forward. Interesting idea, and uh, I'm uh, on the same page with you as the openness. I can see that Holger is... Uh yeah, yeah, so I, I'd like to make a remark on this, um, because first of all, thank you for saying generative AI rather than large language models. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think part of what's really revolutionizing the use of AI currently is precisely the language aspect, right? I mean, it's very impressive what you could do with, you know, music and graphics and video and all that, but I think what really makes people think differently about AI is that now we can basically converse with AI systems in the main way in which we talk to and understand each other. And that's a big deal, right? I mean, if we go back to the 1950s when people first started to seriously think about artificial intelligence, Alan Turing's famous paper, it was all about language, right? He didn't, man he didn't I mean, what he imagined was, was a system with which you could only converse in written language, nothing else. And he was of the belief that such a system, if it behaved realistically enough, should be labeled intelligent, right? And I think he, he picked this for a very good reason. So I think the big transition that we are seeing now is that previously AI techniques were sort of accessible <coughs> only in indirect ways or to specialists. And that's changing, right? Anybody can interact with chat GPT. And of course, also with other generative models that, for instance, translate language into images, right? So this is the big deal. But I honestly think that's also where the big risk comes. Because as we start interacting with systems, as we interact with each other, we naturally overestimate the capabilities of these systems. We sense an intelligence where in reality, what there is, is very little. And you see that even with certain people who now go on record and say, we are seeing sparks of general intelligence in these systems, to which I personally say, no, we don't. We, we absolutely don't. It takes a lot of, of um, imagination to see those sparks, because if you probe those systems just in the right way, uh, you get to the bottom of things very quickly. And, and at the bottom, there is no understanding, almost no understanding whatsoever. Um, I think one of the important things that Europe can contribute, and, and Josef already pointed that way, is to now take another step and make these systems sort of a, a little bit more, how can I say, focus on facts rather than just statistical uh, uh, connections and statistical properties, and also to make those systems able to really um, converse about things and give information about things in a certain depth. 
because that's important, right? It's important in journalism, for example, where these systems are now, of course, being used. It's even more important in science and engineering, right? Uh, we, I think we will talk about that later, but what really frightens me is the idea that anybody might go and say, you know, we don't need to program computers any longer. We can just have ChatGPT produce the code for us. That I think is awful, not because it's not a great vision. It is a great vision. It would be wonderful to be able to do that. But if you do it right now, I think what you get out of it is, is highly unreliable, highly inefficient code in, in most of the cases. Thank you so much for the elaborate answer. Yes, please go ahead. Sir. Maybe maybe quickly adding to this, because I think why is, I wonder why is the society so excited about these models, right? Because if I could just play around and generate images, that's cool, but it doesn't really solve a problem. And now people do that in their everyday life and solving real problems with like, hey, I need this letter. Let's generate this letter. Hey, I need a snippet of code and let's, let's get this code and then they copy paste that in and i think because they're now solving real problems that's where kind of this danger comes in because if i'm only generating images that are fun that nobody's hurt nobody can be hurt but risk like putting them into production and um writing writing real letters then then we have a problem yeah so so there we need to be careful and people need to understand it's not an all-powerful ai right and Okay, yes, go ahead, please. <laughs> I don't want to hear. I, yes, I would like to. Yes. I was leaving this for later, but uh, because images and the uh, video, and especially images, as uh, fun uh, was heard a couple of times, uh, I would like to go back to generative AI, uh, leave a little bit uh, the uh, language models, and um, uh, in our network and in general, it is a big challenge to address one of the biggest misuse of generative AI, which is the realistic uh, synthetic content uh, generation. And this is used in uh, deep fakes and uh, in uh, disinformation campaigns. And it is uh, something uh, really serious. So uh, such disinformation campaigns based on synthetic realistic contents uh, are being used in elections. So these are threatening already our democracy. They have been used uh, during uh, the pandemic and the World Health Organization mentioned, uh, uh, introduced the term infodemic. So they are directly addressing our health. And now in, um, in um, Ukraine, uh, on the same time with the uh, actual war, war, uh, war, there is a, a war on disinformation, which in many cases is against, uh, based on synthetic content generated by uh, uh, AI. For example, there have been in the beginning of uh, the war synthetic videos, uh, both uh, uh, for uh, Putin and Zelensky, bo both of them claiming that uh, they surrender or and uh, the mayor of uh, Berlin uh, was uh, fooled during a video conference that uh, he is uh, discussing uh, with uh, Ukrainian officials and it was a synthetic video in real time. So uh, you can understand all the serious uh, consequences. I know that you are you were referring to something different, but uh, I didn't want uh, to appear that uh, uh, generative uh, AI in uh, media is uh, something that uh, is not uh, important. It is important and uh, it um, threatens uh, key societal values. Actually, I was uh, going to go there. Thank you for this really? answer. This is why I said I was leaving it for later, <laughs> but, uh, since it was mentioned a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, uh, please then use the microphone so no, no, people no, also no. can see me, uh, can uh, hear you. Yeah. Uh, actually, what I see as uh, one of the dangers before I give floor to Mario is that you start to connect those models of generative AI. You are going to use large language models, feed the information through a prompt to video making software, music making software, voice making software. Then you combine it and you go way many levels further. Uh, Mario. Yeah, I can also follow up on this a bit. I think I agree that there is a substantial risk to the very fabric of democracy, you say, by these misinformation campaigns. I think also what we see developing, and that's one of three points I want to make, is that um, so far we have seen kind of static misinformation has been uh, forged. But I think what is potentially happening next is more like dynamic or personalized misinformation in terms of targeting uh, certain people or also evolving over time, which is potentially much more difficult to catch. 
but also might be more speaking to a certain people and have a much more persuasive power to people. So this transition from dynamic to more like uh, static to more dynamic misinformation I see as one of the arising challenges. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is uh, more related to the democratization, which is in principle a, a good thing, but we also think we need to understand that it puts a strong mandate into the hands of the user to decide how to use the technology. I think this needs to come with instruction, education, also awareness about what tasks uh, AI should be used. So we kind of really kind of enabling the users to a wide range of capabilities and need to be aware of that and the risks and dangers and also where it's appropriate or not. I think in particular thinking about a large rollout, for example, as it might be imminent with Microsoft Office, for example, where there's a large um, group of people having access to this. And thirdly, I think is the question that we also investigating right now are potential cybersecurity risks as we are seeing that these technologies are very, very deeply integrated in different applications, really running, running the, the logic and connecting different data sources and applications to uh, evolve into more complex tasks. And what we have been seeing that is not like something that we can easily fix, so to say, to prevent somebody to take over these language models or uh, maliciously manipulate those models. So in short, I think we have to think about the regular use cases, but also adversarial use cases that on purpose try to exploit this novel computer uh, architecture that is rolled out to millions of people right now. So I completely agree with opportunities, but are three of the risks that we see right now um, developing. Thank you so much. Uh, Roman or Josef, do you want to add something on the risks? or maybe future developments uh, with regard to generative AI, where do you see it going? I just have one comment. It's not problem of the technology itself. It's the problem of people using the technology. So I just want to highlight that if we like set a rule, stop developing this technology, it will not help because there will be somebody who will be developing these things. So what we need to do, we need to understand how this technology can be used in bad and good ways. And this is where we should be very careful. But the technology itself is not doing anything bad. That's what I want to say. I see that Holger wants to react. But, but sorry, I mean, Roman, this is very much like, si like saying guns aren't per se bad. So let's just, you know, circulate them freely. I mean, this is an extreme example, right? But, and this, but this is exactly what, what the guns activists um, say in the United States, right? It's not the guns that kill people, it's people that kill people. So let's have everybody have access to assault weapons. But we know what the correlation is, right? You put these weapons into people's hands and there's more people getting killed. That is by now very widely accepted, right? So. My feeling is that with this technology becoming widely available, without people being sensitized to the damage they can do, even under the best intentions, it is quite dangerous. And I also think that the development is so fast currently that even the people that are at the forefront of it have a very limited understanding about the risks and the limitations of these systems that they are creating, right? Um, many of you might have heard about this Shogoth um, meme that has developed, right? Uh, and this has been that this has developed within the Silicon Valley in, uh, uh, infrastructure and ecosystem that is developing uh, these systems, right? And and the meme says very clearly, we are creating something that we don't understand ourselves, and which without a lot of you know layers of added um, niceification on top, actually sometimes feels threatening to us. We're making this stuff. That makes me feel that maybe it is time to, stay, to take a tiny step back and say, let's understand this a little bit better before, before we roll it out, like Mario says, on, on a broad basis. I think it's actually very problematic to just say, hey, let's run with it. If people do bad things with it, well, it's not because the technology is bad. I see that we do have here a first question from the audience. Uh, so let's skip to that. But thank you. I also wanted to react to Mario and say, and to all of you actually, that we do have here a question of personal responsibility. And from the perspective of ethics, law and society, we need to come up with a certain solution that will empower everyone and at the same time help to educate everyone on the dangers. So now, uh, here is a question related to the risks of uh, large language models. One of the largest current risks of generative models are corporate monopolies. Should the EU train its own large language models with its values and public good in mind? So what's your take on? And now maybe I will ask 
all of you to give a very, very brief answer within one sentence. So what's your opinion? Should we train European large language models? I give you one, one word. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can confirm that it makes so much sense to like study them. Then we need to have one. Okay, perfect. Yanis? Yes, I, I agree as well, although not an expert on this. Joseph? It's already happening. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's important and you know, there's been very large, nice effort. They've trained a model which calls Bloom, which is a multiling multilingual model trained on the large computer infrastructure in France by a large community of scientists. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful effort. We should continue in this. Perfect. Okay. Roman? Short answer, why not? And longer uh, response, I did not say that we should provide a technology to everyone. I just said we should not stop developing this technology, but we should be very careful how to use it. Yeah, I think as already mentioned that it's important to keep this technology uh, in, in the open and also uh, for everybody to use. Uh, but I also would say there is obviously trends that we have, some access to some of the models. And as we also mentioned, there are still future challenges, how to train them the way we want them to be, basically. Yeah? So I think it's not just we can push the button right now and get the models that we really like to have, but we need to be in, in the game, so to say, to be uh, enabled to do these things. Yeah? And that really requires fundamental research also mm -hmm. to en enable the, uh, again, compliance with our values. I just will, I will react to myself. I think it's already, ha <laughs> it's already happening, but we need more of that. I think this is really just the first steps in the direction. We need you know, more of this on a larger scale with more people understanding and developing these. Models okay. So, so I'm glad he made this point because, you know, maybe somebody from the commission is watching and we wouldn't want them to have the, the impression that, you know, it's all fine. Let's be very clear, it's not all fine. It, it requires a massive investment. We know what went into OpenAI to enable them to do that. And you know, hey to the colleagues in France, they're doing great work, but that is not the level at which we can compete with anyone, right? That is a good basis. That is a great reason to say, let's invest now more, let's build bigger infrastructure and really enable European researchers to do this properly. But we're not there, right? Joseph, there is more work that needs to be done. Exactly, these are like baby steps, but I think it's a, what I want to mention is that it's a proof of concept. Yes, we can do it, but now you know, we, we can do it on a large scale, on larger scales. Okay, we are in... Uh, uh, we, are all, we all agree that we need to develop EU models. Now, I will elaborate or go deeper on the question from audience and I will ask you in a more difficult way. Feel free to refuse answering. So, should we avoid using models from other countries? Because if we are saying, yes, it's natural, we should develop our own models with regard to our values and uh, ethical approach, but does it really mean that we should avoid using models from elsewhere? Holger? So, so I'm gonna make the start on this one. Um, that is very difficult, right? Because I think our view of the world would be, would be incompatible with, with, this, right? with this idea, right? This would be very much like saying, maybe the European car industry is under pressure, so why don't we make a law that says, you know, only cars manufactured in Europe can drive on European roads. I don't think we would want that. At the same time, we are saying only cars that meet certain safety standards are allowed to drive on European roads. And if a foreign manufacturer wants their products, cars, whatever, uh, used here, they need to comply with the standards. That is the way the European Union and its friends do business. And I think that way should apply to AI technology as well, right? So therefore, um, if, if and when we have our own language models, ones that basically uh, adhere to the same standards, reasonable standards that we can agree on with our friends and trading partners, then it should be open. But if somebody just makes you know, an arbitrary language model that maybe isn't safe, that, that has problems, no, I think absolutely this should not be usable within the European Union and other countries closely aligned with our values. We should protect citizens from bad technology, as we currently do in many other areas of technology. Thank you for this answer. Mario? So obviously, we do have some language models and there's obviously deployment from different sites. Again, obviously, we are kind of also uh, probably facing a future where maybe these are more interconnected, so to say, and interoperable. So that might obviously uh, raise the question, what do we mean by not using them? Obviously, interoperability 
would probably need to be uh, justified and, um, and and verified. And also, again, there will be probably still an open market for different products. Again, I think it's then also more uh, what is currently also laid out in the regulations. If these are in the supply chain or if they are being used in different products, then we obviously want to have our regulations and the suppliers would need to show that they adhere to these standards. And the lawyer inside of me is very happy from these <laughs> answers. No, thank you. Yanis, yes. I would like to take uh, this uh, opportunity. You said, I think, a very important uh, word uh, before, which I think applies to this question as well, and it is education. I think that um, uh, we cannot really, in uh, modern days, uh, restrict uh, completely using language models that uh, are not uh, perfect. Of course, uh, we can uh, apply regulations as well, but I think it is uh, even more important or equally important to educate uh, younger and current generation with European values and how these can be, let's say, applied, put in effect while using uh, these, uh, while using these uh, models. And um, again, we have seen that this is very much important also in the uh, disinformation aspect uh, I was mentioning uh, before. If uh, people think in a specific uh, way and they are not aware of what is happening, no matter how much the technology provides the, eviden the evidence that, for example, something is uh, fake, without the proper understanding and education around this uh, uh, aspect, they cannot, be, they cannot be convinced. So I think um, um, yes, uh, uh, education on all these uh, aspects plays an important role. Thank you so much. Actually, about one month ago, there was an interesting uh, article in Czech newspaper where you could test yourself whether you can recognize a fake or uh, whether it's an original uh, picture. I consider myself as knowing something about AI. I did the test. I succeeded only in 75%. So actually, it it's m not bad, but could be better. Uh, so actually you provided me, Anis, with a nice uh, bridge to the next uh, uh, bunch of questions, uh, the next couple of questions. And uh, let's now focus on uh, the aspect of generative AI of information production. So what is your take on how do you think that generative AI, and I don't mean only large language models, but also pictures, videos, voice, etc. How do you think it will influence our knowledge and information production? Maybe also with regard to education uh, and uh, so how it will influence science, development, etc. Yanis, maybe because you mentioned it uh, yes, of course, uh, there is um, a huge uh, uh, influence. Uh, I would uh, uh, like to mention, and I agree with what said before, of course, there are many, many positive uh, uses of uh, generative AI also in the media uh, sector, for example, in uh, creative uh, industries, amazing uh, uh, things uh, can be uh, done in a very easy and uh, uh, fast uh, way. So, uh, indeed, it's not, uh, let's say, the technology itself provides also positive and, uh, of course, uh, significant uh, uh, negative uh, uh, aspects. But um, uh, I would also like to mention some important, let's say, um, uh, societal uh, changes that uh, are happening and are going to happen. So, for example, we have all uh, learned and uh, uh, this is, let's say, common understanding that seeing is believing. Mm -hmm. This is something that uh, in our times is uh, changing. This uh, generation, I think, in um, uh, some time from uh, now, it will have to learn and it will be in a, let's say, media environment where um, uh, synthetic and uh, real content uh, will be indistinguishable. So I think uh, the changes are, let's say, far more uh, important and uh, general than, uh, let's say, specific sectors and so on. Since all of you are in involved in AI development, can AI help us with distinguishing what was synthetic, what was human produced? Where do you see it going? Do we even have a chance to develop some systems like this? I can comment a bit on this. I think 
one of the first detectors for deep fakes and also attribution a few years ago. And I think by that time it was already clear that this reality gap is probably closing. And um, so to say then the only option is kind of to, to fact checking if it's still factually correct, but then it's still fake information. The other two paths I think people have been considering is something like uh, AI watermarking or fingerprinting. And we also have quite extensively worked on that. But right now, I think there are still concerns that this might also not be a sustainable solution. So somehow we can uh, raise the hurdles, so to say, for attackers to do this. But very advanced attackers will very likely to be able to jump over this also in the future. And maybe the, the third direction is I think we probably also have to strengthen in a systematic approach the information processing from recording data and basically protecting the, the, the true data, so to say, more. I think we can try to increase the barrier to disseminate fake information, but at the same time strengthen our infrastructure that transmits and records information. Thank you, Holger. I, I think these are all very good points, but there's one more aspect that I believe is very important, right? And I'm not sure whether I should be too optimistic about it, but part of me is. And that is people just need to become better skeptics. And that would be good generally, right? I mean, it is a human weakness that all of us have to some extent that we're gullible, right? And in this day and age, Janis said this extremely well, right? Where seeing is no longer believing. It would be wonderful if we could make sure that our kids grow up and don't believe everything they see, they hear, that is presented to them as truth. And that, I think, would be a big step forward for humankind. If we would be, I mean, we want to be benevolent skeptics, but we want to be skeptics also as scientists, right? I mean, one of the things that, that bothers me personally as a, as a scientist about what's happening in AI and what has been happening for the last 10 years is the amount of hype that is even within the scientific community where we should all be trained to be skeptics and a little bit humble about you know our own creations as well. And I feel that sometimes, of course, we too are just human, right? So we get carried away with the general enthusiasm, but it would be good to generally have a little bit more of a skeptical attitude in the population and also within the scientific community regarding all of this. And that would be a step forward. Okay, thank you. Now, when you were uh, speaking your minds, I actually got an idea. However, because Mario mentioned it and I, I saw it, the personalized misinformation, uh, that's going to be a big issue. So now a question for all of you. And uh, again, I will ask for just one sentence reply. Do we humans even have a chance if something like that hits us? personalized misinformation that will, for instance, use like uh, in elections. What I, I saw is that uh, it's possible to take a picture of uh, your own picture, merge it with the politician's picture, and this profile can be shown to you on your social uh, media. And then you are in more in favor of that politician because you somehow relate because 20% of his profile picture is your profile picture. Do we have a chance as people to, let's say, fight this or, or deal with this future in a way that will actually keep the trust in society? So I will start with Mario and I will ask, go this way. <laughs> okay. Be brief as I already had so much time. I, again, was also go with uh, with Holger. We need uh, education, I think, uh, but it will take time. I think the uh, developments are so rapid that this component needs to start basically yesterday. Uh, <laughs> but uh, to, in order to really mitigate the effects we're seeing right now, will be difficult. There's obviously different um, also systematic ways to basically have trusted communication. You know whom you're talking to these can help basically but they're not really adopted uh, right now by society so definitely a mix of education and technology hopefully can help here okay so we do have a chance thank you roman <laughs> yes so short answer yes <laughs> i believe we have a chance but it's not easy mm -hmm. the advantage is that we can learn something about ourselves so uh, we know that our brain is not perfect it's doing mistakes but these mistakes are predictable so it's good if we understand better ourselves. And I believe that AI actually with these deep fakes can help us to understand better ourselves. So this is the positive view of this somehow danger. 
on my Thank own. you. Thank you. Olga. I do agree with you there. At the same time, I feel, <laughs> as Mario said, this is moving awfully quickly, right? And both our legal system and our societal experience um, is, is not capable of moving so quickly right now. And that is actually one of the reasons why I personally decided after much reflection to sign the Future of Life Institute's very controversial letter calling for a pause or at least for a deceleration. I think we need a deceleration uh, in order to make sure that society has a chance to adjust to these new realities. That's not going to happen overnight. And if it just keeps accelerating and accelerating, I do feel there is a real risk that it's going to run away from us. And uh, to connect to something that Janis said earlier, uh, our democratic system would be the first uh, victim of this, right? And we see all the signs for this, um, even, even, even prior to, to this year's latest advances, we've seen what can be done and what people do in order to manipulate the democratic process. I'm very worried about that. Thank you, Sven. I, I hope, I think that's, that's the answer. And education um, paired with good critical reflection of every single piece I'm looking at um, or hearing um, will be probably, hopefully, the goal to to good future. Thank you. Uh, I think we have to have a chance. We don't have <laughs> another uh, option. It is going to be a challenge. It's not uh, easy. Things change uh, uh, very fast. Critical mind, uh, I think it's important. And uh, we have to, to adapt. To give an example, uh, the current uh, trend uh, in uh, personalized uh, uh, Notice from personalized fraud is that uh, you know these usual phone calls of uh, relative of not relative of friends that were uh, of someone unknown who were asking for some uh, money. Now they are personalized. They are imitating uh, through very few examples the voice of uh, your father, your mother, and so on. So you have a very uh, personalized uh, fake content uh, who who is asking money for you and the solution that is currently being adapted is uh, that uh, people with their close relatives, uh, they set up a code mm -hmm. and they say that uh, in case I contact you for some uh, emergency, I will also use this code, of course, not uh, when I'm going to say good morning. So things are changing. And uh, if we want to survive, we have uh, to adapt together with all the other things. We actually, as a family, already have the safe word. Yeah. <laughs> Josef. I also remain on the optimistic side, but of course education is very important. I want to also say that I think the technology itself can also help us in helping to identify. I know the field is moving fast, but of course there is a you know, field of trying to detect the, you know, the disinformation. And I think we need to leverage that, have more research in this area and leverage that as much as possible because at the scale the disinformation may be appearing, it just will be very difficult to you know, deal with it manually. So we'll have to have some automated techniques to help us with that. And with the same, I think already it's happening on some of the social networks, uh, is that you are getting these flags, you know, careful, this may be misinformation. I think we just need more of that, of that help uh, from whatever resource to help people to first you know, to, uh, this may be even playing the role of training them of identifying these things and then being better at recognizing such issues. Thank you so much. Now, from your answers, we can say that we are in this all together. We need to somehow come up with solutions. And that also comes to training of AI systems. And now I will put my lawyer's hat on and I want to ask you about training those systems with regard to intellectual property protection. Because what's going on is that web scraping uh, robots are going through all the internet, taking our text, whatever we have set everywhere, wh wherever posted on our blog, etc. How would you personally approach this topic? Do you think that since there is a benefit of training those models, we should just go ahead and ignore or let's say justify uh, the web scraping and training with the higher good or should we be more careful with intellectual property protection what's your take on what's your take on training ai systems with regard to uh, available content holger 
I think we have to be very careful. I mean, now let's look at, at the topic that we sort of steered clear of earlier, which is arts, right? Um, so, you, you know, right, right now what's happening is that, that these large language, these, these large generative models, they're being trained with a lot of copyrighted uh, and intellectual property of artists and so on. And then everybody can generate uh, art in that style. And, you know, from my personal experience, it's mostly really bad imitations, but that will change, right? So I think if we want to protect the niche for human artists, and I think we should, that is essential to the human condition, we need to respect their rights. And that means that we must not allow systems to be trained on these currently legally protected contents without people's consent. And I personally think artists should be uh, allowed to you know, ask the question, did OpenAI use my intellectual property? And if the answer is yes, they did, and they didn't pay for it, I think they should be sued and they should be made paid and made paid big amounts of money in order to create an obstacle. Now, of course, it's very difficult to, to do this, right? But that doesn't mean we shouldn't, we shouldn't have the principle that, that we shouldn't attempt it. I think there are very good reasons why intellectual property is uh, protected. And this is not the time to give it up. Great. This is the time to double down on it. Sven. So, so, so earlier we had this analogy on how humans talk to each other and how we reason. Um, so we look at a lot of paintings. That doesn't mean we reproduce them. So is it the looking and training on them to get a sense of the world that's the problem here or the models then copying what they saw? And right now we're not a general artificial intelligence, so we models can only go so far beyond their boundaries, which is an issue, so that they, they, they generate what they see. Um, but in the future, just because we all looked at things, we all looked at a Picasso, we don't produce one, we don't try to forge one, um, isn't, it, shouldn't there be a difference between looking at content and generating that content? You know, I think there is, this is a interesting question because actually there is regulation already on text and data mining under the European law that actually allows to make a copy, reproduce work in order to train algorithms. However, there is uh, also a note that whenever an artist or an author doesn't want his work to be uh, to be included, he can put in me metadata this exception, like, please don't use me for training. Exactly. However, there are already AI systems that uh, are used for web scraping and they go through, they go past login, they don't respect anything. So do you think we can fight those systems somehow? <laughs> So yeah, I, I was hoping in a similar direction that there's different use cases. Again, there's diff if I take a, a picture from the internet, there's different things I'm allowed or not allowed to do with that image. Um, I also want to uh, uh, append to the, the, the argument that this also holds for source code, obviously. Uh, many of the code completion models right now, uh, they're also trained on different codes with different licenses, and that would kind of remove that license, which would be bad in that case. And I think there are certain lawsuits also pending that I think say uh, exact copies are definitely bad, but for others we don't quite know. There are certain techniques that potentially allow for attribution of certain performance, but this is very difficult to compute. On the other di direction, we also have been looking into um, kind of forensics methods, uh, mostly stemming from actually privacy, where we can actually um, um, compute for certain images if they were likely part of the training data set. So there are certain techniques that potentially allow for a certain attribution, potentially also for black box models, but that's um, a bit of also a uh, developing uh, field overall. And the last comment I want to make is also that these also extend to the model itself. So right now the data is being used to train a model, but we're also seeing different cases where then another model is trained on top of that model. So in a similar way, also these um, people who have used the data to train a model also have right now potentially a hard time to protect their IP or their status quo. For example, in the open language model that we were seeing, they're being trained, for example, based on other language models in a kind of student teacher way. So this whole situation is developing sort of in all the levels and kind of attributing what value was created, which point is increasingly difficult, obviously. Yeah, we do have a problem with how to change actually uh, this and uh, ensure protection. Now, when 
Does any one of you have more comments? Maybe yes, Yosef. And again, I, I think it's the, you know, the, the science which will, I think, help here because there are very, you know, many smart people working in this area, you know, a lot of in the project of, uh, of, um, of Mario, for example. But I think one of the techniques which is sort of, you know, recently becoming, I mean, published or available is actually, it's, it is becoming possible to remove certain concepts from already trained models. So imagine that, you know, as an artist, it's like an opt-out almost option where, you know, you, you could be, uh, you know, could ask to be removed and the model, you know, will not be able to generate your style anymore. So I think there is a research in this direction and progress being made in this direction. So I think it's not a lost case. It's important to protect that both on the data collection side, maybe going only for you know, the Creative Commons mm -hmm. uh, content. And also once it's trained, you know, on the opt out later that, you know, I don't want to be generated. Uh, so I, I think there is a progress in this direction also. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, Holger. Just one more thing. I mean, I'm just reminded by Josef talking about that. He said himself earlier, and I very much agree with that, that, you know, we, we need uh, European capabilities in terms of these large generative models that are actually on par with the state of the art, right? And maybe even push it further. And then, Josef, you said something that I think is really important. You said, let's do that in an open and transparent way. And that, of course, includes knowing what the training data was, right? So, so my feeling is, you know, if you give people a choice between a model where we know that it's been respectful of people's intellectual property, that it didn't, didn't go beyond that in meta information that said, please don't use my stuff. And that model still is very good. And some black box things that might have been trained on anything, I think many people would make a responsible choice. And that is one of the reasons why I think uh, we in Europe, and I don't just mean the EU, I would explicitly include the UK in that, for example, which has very important AI capabilities, right? Um, we in Europe need to make sure that we have these capabilities ourselves and that we are setting a role model for doing it responsibly. And I think we can, as Josef said, as, as Mario said, and many others, we have the capability in Europe to do that. We, we just need the resources to, to bring this up to the, to the state of the art, which we currently don't. You just mentioned transparency and uh, explainability, transparency and knowing on what the system has been trained are very much connected. So uh, here's a question. How can we ensure transparency and explainability of generative AI? I would like to know opinion of each of you, again, in the form of one, maximum two sentences. Do you think we can achieve it and how can we achieve it with uh, large uh, uh, generative AI models? So who goes first? Josef. <laughs> I, I don't think we quite have a proof it cannot be achieved. So I think, again, you know, uh, it's science, so we should try. And I think there is work in this area. And I was just came from the computer vision program workshop, and there are people working on this right now. And I think it's a very exciting area. And I'm, I think we'll have progress. And the more Perfect. resources we'll have, the more progress we'll have. Great. Thank you. Yanis? Yes, I agree. It is uh, challenging, but I don't think it is um, uh, ultimately possible. OK. Sven? Yeah, same. It's incredibly challenging. Um, but if we stop thinking that it's possible, then we lost already. So let's hope it's possible and keep trying. Holger? I think it will require a very determined push, but I don't see why that push shouldn't succeed, right? It's just if we don't put the push, then I think it'll not happen all by itself. Roman? Yeah, I agree. My short answer is I don't know, because this is not my era. In symbolic AI, this is definitely achievable. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this uh, neural AI is it, but as everyone says, we should definitely try to do it. Perfect. I think it's hard to predict where we can get. We're definitely are trying very hard right now. I think there's also lots of terms that have very subtle meanings and definitions in terms of legal, but also in terms of technical. Uh, so uh, if diving into this, we'll probably take a longer discussion. And But overall, I think we might be also have to realize that we might have trade off transparency and uh, explainability and utility at some point. So if we're willing to make those trade-offs in the end, uh, I think a lot of can be achieved. Perfect, thank you. I love the fact that you all see it as a challenging, but you don't fear it. Like, <laughs> let's, let's tackle this challenge, which is very optimistic. And uh, I love that. So now we covered actually a lot. And now uh, I would like to ask you, 
what do you think and it may not be only generative AI but uh, AI in general there are so many uh, ethical problems uh, related to AI systems from your perspective what do you see as the most important ethical issue when it comes to AI uh, there are many and I would like to hear like one word one sentence from each of you again maybe we can again start from the other uh, side starting with Mario because uh, your perspectives will like uh, build a bigger picture um, I think uh, maybe the main risk would be to not think it really from from the human side and kind of what kind of put the human at the center of the development I think um, maybe I just rephrasing what the decision is but I think maybe that's something that we really uh, should always keep as our compass and directive so human in the center Okay, Raman? Yeah, I'm not expert in this era, but definitely when the system is touches human, we should be careful. And I believe we can learn a lot from, let's say, medical research, where this problem has been for a long time. It's very new for us in computer science because we just work with these un unlife things uh, and it was mm -hmm. very easy for us. But now it's becoming much complicated because we are touching directly humans. So anything where there is a human, we should be very careful. Okay, thank you. Holger? I think the biggest risk going forward is, is to forget about human limitations and weaknesses and, and also the fact that the same weaknesses probably pop up in systems that, that we train uh, on a lot of human-generated data. And I think you know our own blind spots then become blind spots of the system. Um, and, and that I find a little problematic. The human-centered approach helps because it, it focuses us towards building systems that support us, that augment us, that maybe help us deal with our weaknesses better. And therefore, I think it is key um, to, to being successful here in a responsible way. Thank you. Sven? Maybe building up on that, uh, the collaboration part is super important, I think. But we need to work together um, for, for keeping the moral compass always point in the same direction. And that's something we also spoke earlier about is like currently we have companies developing these and we don't know what their compass is. So again, from a European, European perspective, building them with our compass in the collective compass, that would be super important to overcome these risks in the future. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, I would also agree with uh, the human uh, aspect and uh, just mention a couple of relative uh, keywords uh, like fully automated decision making, uh, making uh, relevant uh, to humans, discrimination, bias and so on. Perfect. Joseph? I think my answer is it depends on the application. Okay. Uh, and I think we, we should, you know, of course, when it's medical and it's suggesting, you know, of course, not making decision, but suggesting options to a medical doctor of course it's you know utmost importance has to be explainable you know we have to but if you have a system which is just being employed as a chatbot in a computer game you may you may have very different requirements on the i mean not the same probably so i think you know i i would be very practical about it and and just the applications should drive the requirements and okay. it, you know, of course we can make big statements how important things are but in the end you know, it, these are differences in, in which depend on applications. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Now we are actually uh, getting to the uh, end of our discussion and the last topic that I had in mind when preparing for this discussion panel was cybersecurity and safety and security of AI systems in general. Before uh, the panel, we uh, spoke with Holger about potential issues related to cybersecurity and uh, uh, there is a question of uh, uh, tools like GitHub Copilot or um, tools that are actually writing a code. I, I was actually two months ago, I was at a conference where people, CEOs of companies were saying that they are actually firing all their programmers because they don't need them anymore. They are just using those tools. And that of course presents certain risks. So uh, I would like to hear from your side, where do you see safety and security issues when it comes to AI, to generative AI, but AI in general, because there are so many. And all of you, when I was asking you about the ethical issue, 
you all mentioned risks. You were actually already going that direction. So let's focus strictly on safety, security and cybersecurity. Holger. So, I mean, what's very little known, but, but of course, uh, uh, it's a fact, right, is that what we have in terms of correctness in computer systems is entirely thanks to AI, right? Automated reasoning techniques touch absolutely every chip, uh, every CPU that's being built into anything, any, any GPU. We wouldn't have deep learning without that, right? Um, so those are the unsung heroes of symbolic AI that made this possible, right? Biggest commercial success of AI so far because without it, we wouldn't have the hardware that's running our stuff and we wouldn't have the correct software where they need, that we need in certain critical applications as well, right? So that's, that's the first point. The second point is I think it's incredibly dangerous to at this point try to replace human programmers, uh, well-trained human programmers. Uh, you know, my group has been looking into this and, and so have countless others by now. Uh, the quality of what's coming out um, of, you know, large generative models in terms of code tends to be bad in a very problematic way in that, you know, not only tend, tend there to be uh, problems, um, efficiency problems, but also real correctness problems. But sometimes these are hidden in ways that are very unintuitive to humans, right? So I think in some sense, the AI is the answer to correctness, which is something that, that, that people are very bad at, right? I mean, it's incredibly difficult to train human programmers to write correct and efficient code, right? So AI is the answer but not the kind of AI that we currently have in generative models. So we need a different kind of generative model, one that can reason, one that is better than human, superhuman in its powers to actually understand correctness and to, to ascertain correctness. Uh, and that I think would be a very, very important direction for such models in the future, especially in Europe, where we have a long and, and very successful history in product safety. And mm -hmm. that of course should extend to, uh, you know, to, to uh, IT products. Okay, thank you so much. Anyone would like? Yes, go ahead, Mario. Um, I think I, I made a point earlier. But I also agree that uh, these models happily produce security vulnerabilities uh, and code that has these. So that's an, an issue, obviously. Um, I I think the the um, maybe uh, kind of pivotal shift here is that now we s foresee like a very broad deployment of these AI technologies and maybe even driving some of these applications. So I think it's uh, it's becoming more and more true that uh, this is an integral part of our IT infrastructure. And therefore I think it also has to be seen as such also with the security implications. And I think um, we have a great history of uh, thinking about security after the product launch or as an afterthought. and. Uh, the reviews are mixed for our previous experience. So um, so that's something that uh, would be a wish to consider that from early on. And we're definitely doing this in our research and our efforts to raise awareness of this and also provide solutions to make that technology more uh, safe and secure and also try to um, fix some of these emerging cybersecurity issues. But definitely, as we're talking about these large language models, the status quo here is that it's very difficult uh, to fix. Some of them might not be fixable, but there's definitely certain research that can mitigate those risks or in certain scenarios maybe eliminate. But that's something that is, again, ongoing research while we see this rapid immersion of uh, <laughs> different applications that build on that basically core framework. So, so that's something I think that will uh, keep us busy definitely for the, for the coming time. Thank you. Now let's let's uh, defocus from generative AI models. I will ask uh, Roman because you are in symbolic AI. Where do you see safety and security risks there in this branch of AI? Yeah. So as Holger mentioned, it's much easier in this era because it's based on formal models that can be verified. So we can somehow trust these systems more than the systems that are developing themselves just from data because these are somebody said oh this is not ai this is just an algorithm right so for algorithm yeah we can do some some verification but i've also uh, like related answer to previous question about the risk and about substituting programmers it's also about responsibility so who will be and that's for the lawyers probably more who will be responsible for this software right now when we buy a computer program, 
there is this long list or you are responsible for everything. Uh, there are no bugs inside, these are just features and everything. So it will be even worse if it will be produced by, by nobody, right? So we will be responsible for decisions of that system. So that's a related question to these risks. We as lawyers have a hard time with uh, coming up. There is a new directive on liability of AI systems, but I don't think that solves everything. And uh, because as I said, we are all in it and each of us needs to have responsibility. Individual responsibility will be more important than ever. Uh, we all will be responsible somehow for the design, for the use. Uh, so all of us will have the higher power and higher responsibility. Uh, with that, we are getting to the last minutes of our discussion panel. So what would be your final message for the audience? And keep in mind that people will be able to uh, see the recording even later and your message will spread really very much. Now putting a bit of burden on you and responsibility. So what you would you like the audience to take away from this discussion? What they should keep in mind when using AI, when using generative AI, and when putting new algorithms in the world? What would be your key message? So, Josef. <laughs> um, I think, uh, so the you know, the field is developing rapidly, but I think that, you know, for me, it's the science to the rescue is that, you know, we can solve problems and we are, you know, working on it. And I think with, you know, enough resource, we will solve the problems. We will sort of try our best to mitigate the issues, we may not solve everything, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, be a lot of the stuff about explainability and transparency of these models, it will, I believe it will get down to a large extent. Thank you. Yeah, nice. I will summarize uh, three aspects which I think uh, were mentioned several times uh, today. One is uh, what uh, Joseph mentioned, we need uh, technology both uh, to, for positive uh, uses and uh, to fight against uh, negative uses. We need the uh, regulations, uh, it is uh, difficult but uh, we must uh, be protected from all these advances in several cases and we need the education and this uh, critical uh, mind in order to use and interact uh, with uh, both the technology and the regulations. <laughs> Thank you Sven. Uh, I, would, I would say there's ginormous development and innovation coming in the future. And uh, from a user perspective, I would hope that everybody reflects on what they're doing and how they use technology. And from a developer perspective, us researcher, we should reflect whatever we do and to like, how could this impact the world? If we do that, then we are on a good path to the future. Perfect. Holger? Agree with everything that has been said. So I'd like to put a message out there to the people whose tax euros are being used for some of the research that we're all educating and, and carrying out and also to the European Commission and, and the people who, you know, basically ultimately have responsibility for allocating these funds. And, and this is my message. We're at a very critical junction, right? Um, if we now accept that, you know, the music in AI is being composed, played uh, and, and performed elsewhere, right? Um, and, and we just regulate this in Europe. Um, I think uh, we are on a path to very severe problems um, for everyone, right? We will become economically and technologically completely dependent on a kind of technology that deeply embeds values that are not ours. You said earlier, we don't know what are the values that, that these companies, that drives these companies. Actually, we do. Um, we do because American companies by law um, need to first and foremost maximize shareholder value, right? So we know exactly what they're doing and it's not evil, it's what they're supposed to do. But if we trust on that to produce our future, I think it's very bad. And what is the answer to that? The answer to that is that public institutions in the full light of you know, public inquiry need to be able to conduct that kind of research, that kind of development, so that A, we have alternatives, alternatives that are based here in Europe, but that are also held to higher standards of transparency and openness and safety. Um, and also so that we don't become dependent on just a small number of companies that might at any given point decide that 
it's no longer in the in their interest in the interest of their shareholders to give us full access to the technology thank you roman yeah just a short message that i always use at the end of my talks about ai and this is don't play ai this computer has no brain use your <laughs> own brain thank you <laughs> thank you mario that's a very good one <laughs> yeah i think um maybe uh, that we i think should embrace the european values and also uh, be proud that we innovate in this area in, in this common understanding i think that's we share this understanding and to me it's also the only sustainable way to make progress based on fundamental science and carrying over to innovations that help europe so but i think we need to kind of reinforce our values and also appreciate and be proud of them and, and carry them forward. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your time, for amazing panel discussion, for your key takeaways. And I will now ask the audience to give you a big hand to Josef, Janis, Sven, Holger, Roman and Mario. So thank you so much. And of course, we should thank Alspeta for uh, the wonderful job she did in moderating this panel. We should thank once again our hosts here at CERC. Uh, Josef is actually one of them, but there are many others. I see Eva back there. She and her team have done a great job in making this event possible. And also, I'd like to thank everybody who helped with the demos today. And of course, to all of you who made it worth our while to share our thoughts and to give you a little bit of an impression of, of what AI research here at CERC, in the networks and beyond uh, is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you.